Our Father and our God, we worship you this morning. And we bless you and we give you praise. We thank you for your mercy and your goodness. We thank you for all things working for our good. We thank you for this new day. Thank you for this new month. We thank you for another opportunity to come into your presence. We do not take it lightly or for granted. We are not ignorant of the attempts of the enemy to hinder us from worshipping you, from seeking you, and from walking in light of what you have taught us and what you showed us to do. But you always made a way for us. And this morning would come again with mercy and grace, asking for fresh unction and anointing, firstly upon my heart and upon my lips. That Lord, I may speak accurately as an oracle of God. I pray that the word will come from you through me to the people in simplicity, in clarity, doing both an internal as well as an eternal work in every heart, including my own. I pray for mercy to be faithful in the delivery of this word. Now, these words will cause our minds to be enlightened, our wills to be more submitted to your will, and our emotions more controlled by the power of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We pray that, Lord God, these words will cause us to enter into a level of revelation. And power will be released, power to heal, power to deliver, power to break yokes, and to free men to be doers of the things that we shall hear, and all be hearers only in the name of Jesus. I pray also that the gifts of the Spirit will be released to me in sufficient measure. The word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, tongues, interpretation of tongues, workings of miracles, discernment of spirits, gift of healings of special faith and of prophecy to enable these words to be backed by sufficient power. At the end of the day, let your name be glorified and let we, your children, be blessed in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Praise the name of the Lord. First Peter chapter one. Sorry, second Peter. <laughs> second Peter. Second Peter chapter one. We started this last week and uh, we really couldn't move past verse one. And I believe that's because we took time to do a recap of the whole book of First Peter. So today we're going to go straight into Second Peter. We are in verse one, Second Peter chapter one, and in verse one, I believe it should be up. We will recap what we did last week, and I don't even think we finished. We read from verses one through three, but I don't think we even finished verse one. So let's just see how the Lord will lead us this morning. Second Peter chapter one, verses one. To three. Let's read it again so that we pick it up from where we were. Simon Peter, read with me. Simon Peter, a born servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Please, this morning, open your mouth. We have been talking about the dead church. We are not a dead church in Jesus' name. I say we are not a dead church in Jesus' name. May I use this opportunity to welcome our internet viewers, those who are watching us online, YouTube, Facebook. We welcome you in Jesus' name, and we pray that the same blessings that is upon us here on site will also meet you and let's to come forth into you all in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, I will speak to them. Peter, servant, of Jesus Christ. To those who obtain my precious things to us and the righteousness of sin, Jesus Christ is true. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. I know I'm using a mic, but speak up. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power was free, speaking to us some things, all things attain life and what happens to the knowledge of him who called us who we ancient. 
I said last week, this is the second first one, let's be studying. Of Peter's writings are Genesis is so much in what works. So, when has the other more well, kids time to lay out and span it, explain? Peter was drop his points to the one place. But that was so pregnant, which is why the letters are still small. In all, first of course, two and a half years. Study. Now, in this verse one, we see Peter identifying himself that he is the one. He goes on to say he's a born servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. In that opening introduction, we looked at it last week. If we look at the uh, New Living Translation version, it changes the word born servant to that of a slave. It says, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. Let's, let's deal with that area first and finish with it. We started looking at it last week and said, we said that, you know, he called himself a born servant, which also means slave. The same thing that James did introduce himself in James chapter 1, verse 1. He said, James, a born servant, a slave of Jesus Christ. The same description used by Paul in Romans chapter 1 and in verse 1, when he's, when he's uh, introducing himself as the writer, he says, Paul, a born servant and a slave of Jesus Christ chosen to be an apostle, the same thing. You know, we will look at those two and, and we say that these guys who were pillars in the church chose to call them slaves, themselves slaves of Jesus Christ. They sold everything. They realized a truth. The truth is that if you want to be great, if you want to be great, you must be a servant of Jesus Christ. A slave. The way to being great is not to lord greatness over others, but to be a servant. Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Let's look at Matthew chapter 20. Let's start from there. Matthew 20, the Lord Jesus is admonishing his disciples and showing them a key of how to become great in this life. Because of time, it's, it's a, it's a, it, the thing starts from uh, verse 20. All right, let's go to verse 20 so that we have a full picture of what's, what's going on here. Matthew 20, 20. <laughs> then the mother of James and John let me go back to the New King James. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine, James and John, may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. She was asking Jesus to place her sons in a position of power and royalty. It's interesting that she was not asking for herself. You know, thank God for parents. We always want our children to be great. Praise the Lord. Amen. And he said to her, uh, but Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? The Lord Jesus was saying, you are asking for your sons to sit on my right and on my left. There is something that is going to qualify me to sit in that place. Can your sons 
do what I'm about to do, to qualify them to also sit there. That's what he was saying. And they said to him, say, we are able. Whatever you do, we are going to do. He said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. If you go on to read what happened to the disciples, the apostles after Jesus left, you will know that what Jesus was saying was correct. They went through a turbulent time, a time of tribulation, a time of persecution. Some of them were crucified upside down. Some of them were beheaded. Some of them were stoned to death. Some of them were put in boiling oil. They were killed. All of them were martyred. So the same thing that Jesus faced, they faced. So that's what Jesus was saying, that indeed, you're going to face it. But to sit on my right hand, on my left, is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. And in verse 24, when the other 10 had it, there were 12 of them. You can imagine 12 of them, two of them are now asking, forget this other 10. And then put us on your right and your left. They were displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself. Now listen. And said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet, it shall not be so among you. Now, this verse 26. Let's read it together. You must say it with your mouth. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you. You want to become great in this life. Ever is a blank check. I can so we can say, yet Frank Enoch desires to become great. We can say. Martin desires to become great. We can say that uh, Edet desires to become great. Any name can be put inside there. That's why I say whoever. The formula is this. Whoever desires to become great amongst you, let him be what? Your what? Your what? A servant. A servant. The way to become great is to be a servant of the Lord. That's why Peter was saying a bond servant. Born seven means I'm bound, bound to him. Nothing can separate me from him. A born seven, a slave, I belong to him completely. That's the only way you can become great. Praise the Lord. Are you listening to me? There's no, there's no, there's no other key to greatness. This is Jesus saying. And verse 27. And whoever desires, I can't hear you. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be what? Let him be what? Your slave. Those two words. Let him be your slave. Now, we don't want to hear this. Nobody wants to be a servant. Nobody wants to be a slave. Don't be a slave to man. Don't be a servant to man. But to the Lord Jesus, we must be servants and slaves. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Some of us discovered this many years ago. And we are so Nothing, nothing will shake us. Nothing will separate us. Nothing will move us. Nothing. Sold out. All our time, all our energy, all our resources. Nothing. 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 To the last dime, to the last strength, to the last commitment is set to God. Praise the Lord. Because that's the way to be great. And we're not even doing it because we want to be great. We're doing it because we understand that he owns our lives. You know, we saw the scripture last, last week. And I believe it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 6.20. It says, you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. You don't belong to yourself. You know, all this thing about self. It's about me. It's about me. It's about me. It's not about you. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. And look at verse 28. I hope you're still there. Uh, you move. Please go back. Verse 28. Matthew 20, we're now in 28. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 
Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Listen to me. You're not on this earth to be served. God didn't send you here for people to serve you. He sent you here as a servant to serve others. Therein is your greatness. Therein is your power. Therein is your glory. Therein is your destiny. Therein is your eternity. There is no blessing in being served. There is blessing in service. That's why Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. These things of the kingdom are foolishness. It looks upside down. Ah, I want to be great. I want to be this. I want to be that. Even in the secular world, when we elect a president, we're electing a chief servant. We expect him to serve. When we elect a governor, we're not electing somebody to drive flashy cars and enrich himself. We're electing somebody to serve. Praise the Lord. We're electing somebody to make the lot of the people better. I was driving around Calabar yesterday. I saw streets are being tired. Traffic lights are coming on. I said, ah, sweetness is coming back to the town. The roads are being tired. Even this uh, federal housing that are called Calabar North. I saw they've tired. They, they were tying the road, filling the potholes. I saw, I was driving past the stadium. I almost ran into trouble. I didn't know the traffic light was back. I was driving. I said, ah, red light. And I pulled on the brakes. And the policemen saw me were laughing. They told me to go back. They realized that I didn't know that lights were back. So you can see some form of service. Something is going on about the people. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What we have had, we've had it upside down where the leaders are only interested in enriching themselves. Only interested. You are chosen to serve. Let me put it this way. You are saved to serve. The Bible says we are saved unto good works. So that's why Peter, and look at those guys. Look at those three. Let's use those three people as an example. The three of them that we read. Peter, a born servant. This is the Peter whom his shadow is healing people. In choosing to serve, he is exalted. In choosing to humble himself, God lifts him up. Praise the Lord. Paul, a born servant. And these are not people who were just, you know, riffraffs. Peter was not as educated as Paul was, but he was a fisherman with a thriving fishing business. He had boats. He had his fish. The sons of Zebedee, James and John, their father had servants. Paul was a lawyer, a Pharisee, sat under the feet of Gamaliel. He was not an illiterate. So J James, you know, was, 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 was the brother of Jesus. So they were not just people that were just anyhow, but they realized that their greatness, they had no choice but to be born servants, slaves of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. How many of you know that Joseph was a slave? How many of you know that? Amen. Amen. Well, look at where it got him to. Hallelujah. How many of you know we don't even know what his name was. You know, I don't know. Maybe my revelation may be Eliza because he said that may, that Eliza, you know, when Abraham was telling God that let Eliza stand before him as his chief servant, and Abraham, God said, no, the person who shall be your heir shall come from your body. When it was time to choose a wife for Isaac, it was Eliza that went to look for Isaac. The Bible said that everything that his master had was in his hand. Praise the Lord. He is the one who chose which animals, the silver and the gold, to go to go and get a wife for Isaac. You know, Abraham did not dictate to him what to do. Everything was in his hand. So once you are a servant of, 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 of Jesus, he places everything in your hand. Praise the name of the Lord. He gives unto you the power. He gives unto you authority. So, I'm, I'm taking time to say this by the Spirit because we need to change our mindset. All of us want to be up there. We want to be the, the, 
the big boys, the big girls who want to be those in charge. In the kingdom, it's not like that. You must be a servant, a slave, born servant. And we saw last week that a born servant means that when he tells you go, you go. You don't argue. No slave argues with the master. Praise the Lord. Any slave that have, in those days, slave trade, when they were slaves, what happens with a slave that argues with the master? What happens? Beating, it's put to death. Kill him. A master had power of life and death over the slave. Complete. Slave does misbehave. Kill him. The slave's children belong to the master. The slaves, everything the slave had belonged to the master. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's, 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 that's what, that's the picture you must have. All I have, there's something we used to say, you know, I think the Catholic Church, if I can remember it, all I have is dying and I'm dying, something like that. I've forgotten now. Everything I have is yours. A born servant, a slave, a body, our spirit, our souls belong to God. The more you stop doing your own thing and submit to God, the more you manifest the wisdom, the character, and the power, and the greater your reward in this life and in eternity. The worst thing you can ever do is to tell God, leave me, I don't want, leave me alone. You lie. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. So that's the first Let's go back to First Peter. That's where we are. We're on the first line. Sorry. Second Peter. I'm still used to First Peter. Second Peter. Chapter 1, verse 1, part 1 of verse 1. Simon Peter, a born servant, a slave. Then the second thing is introducing himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's, again, another issue that we can just jump over. An apostle is not just a title. It's not that, it's not that I said last week, it's not about printing a card and putting there Apostle, let me combine names now, Apostle Thunder uh, God's Power. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's not what makes you an apostle. Combine, just put some names and say you're an apostle. No. An apostle means somebody who is sent to preach the gospel and has achieved a level of grace usually that comes through self-denial and faithfulness. Nobody becomes an apostle overnight. Also, before you get to the level of apostle, you spend years of self-denial, of suffering, of growing in God, growing in grace, and God continues to add to you grace upon grace, grace upon grace, grace upon grace. Praise the Lord. The apostle was one of the gifts given to the Lord by the Lord Jesus to the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, the Bible says he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some teachers, some pastors and evangelists, fivefold ministry. The apostle is chief, is the top. Apostolic ministry is the foundation of the church. For you to be able to get to that level, before you can get to the point of saying you are an apostle, you have grown in grace and in the knowledge of God. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Amen. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. Ephesians 2, 20. Ephesians 2, 20. Let's read 19 from verse 19. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are a member of the household of God. Praise the Lord. Tell your neighbor, you are no longer a stranger. You are not a foreigner. You are a fellow citizen with the saints and member of the household of God. In case you didn't know that, 
You are now a citizen of, of heaven. Praise the Lord. Amen. You are, not, you are not a Nigerian. You are not an ethnic man. You are a kingdom person. You so happen to have been born in Nigeria. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So the apostolic faith, the apostolic office is the foundation of the church. That's why Peter was such a strong pillar. Peter, James, and John, those guys, when Jesus have trained them, he now called them apostles. They were not apostles overnight. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Remember when Jesus sent them out two by two to go and cast out devils? You know, when they came back and said, we saw, we saw that even demons were jumping out in your name. Jesus prayed a prayer and said, oh Lord, thank you. Because you have hidden these things from the fathers and you have showed them to babes. They were spiritual babies. At that time, they were not apostles. But after they have grown in grace, he now called them apostles, apostolic ministry. And he sent them out. Go and preach the gospel to all the nations. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So Peter is both a slave and an apostle. Somebody who is sent. That's why he can be in his house. Watch this. Sleeping. And then he'll get a message. Get up. Go to the house of Cornelius. And he must go. He must go. He must go. The same thing. Separate Paul and Barnabas for the work that we have done for them. They must go. If you are a, a, a slave, a servant, and an apostle, whatever work God calls you to do, you must do it. You have nothing else to do. That's your calling. That's your work. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Do you think that Paul had no, he, he, he just liked to go on those missionary journeys to Galatia, to Ephesus. Look at all the persecution, all the, all the affliction. Look at all the troubles that he faced. But he recognized that this is what I was created to be. I'm taking time to say this because some of us need to change our mindset. Some of us, is Jesus your Lord? Yes, but in name, not in deed. Or, the Holy Spirit says, I should put it another way. For some of us, Jesus is Lord 50% of the time. When is that 50%? When it is convenient for you. When it's convenient for you, it is Lord. When it's not convenient, I am my own Lord. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things that I say you should do. Praise the Lord. Amen. So please, brethren, it's so important what we are, what we are, what we are saying. And we must experience and understand that it's important. These children, children, or shall that's what we think to that's the I don't need to tell you that. Move it up to you. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. It took me time to say this because a person is not just to what you do. Because it's so bad since the test. In fact, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, go, go there. Let's talk about what uh, Paul said, let's read from verse 11. Read Hennel's version in this vision. Hennel's. Let's read it in the end. 7 Corinthians 12, verse 11. I'll read. You have made me act like a fool. You ought to be writing commendations for me, for I'm not at all inferior. To those super apostles, even though I have nothing at all. When I was with you, 
I certainly gave you proof that I am an apostle. For I patiently did many signs and wonders and miracles among you. Praise the name of the Lord. He said, the only thing I failed to do, which I do in the other churches, was to become a financial burden to you. Paul said that the signs of this for the, the big signs that should was this. What was that? The big signs that showed that there has grown grace. And because it has grown grace, spiritual capacity, certain signs were following him. Praise the Lord. So, somebody can just walk up to you and tell you, I need this kind of power, power. What makes it possible? What are the signs? What is the proof? Praise the Lord. Amen. So, this apostolic faith of both is actually joined. Now, apart from the signs, it also has relationship and wisdom and the ability to teach. Look at these letters that are just writing. It shows if the Grace that they are carrying. So being an apostle is not just about giving doing miracles. Listen to me. Many people have been deceived of miracles. Miracles is not a sound of voice at all. Let me say that again. Miracles is not a sign of God's approval. Because the Bible says that Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. The devil can keep on deeper us. When Moses threw his rod on the floor, what happened to it? What happened to it? He became a snake. Amen. Is that correct? When Pharaoh's magicians, the Bible even tells us their names, jumpers, jumpers, they threw their own rod on the floor. What happened to it? He became a snake. Was it God doing it? Ah. Praise the Lord. But, of course, Moses told it their own. To show that they are. No, let's go. Let's go. Because three things come. Let's go. Since you think that every miracle means that it is God, God approves. Well, then. Chapter 5. Media, please, have you found? Media. Is it seven? Okay. Yes. All right. So Moses, let's read from verse 10. Take it from verse 10. So Moses and Aaron. What, what version are we doing? New King James. From verse 10. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so, just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became what? It became what? Please, I've told you, turn to your neighbor and say, you're not a dead church. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not a dead church. Say it with part with life. You're not a dead church. You must open your mouth. Let's try it again. 
Okay, let's go. What happened? Yes. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became what? A serpent. Verse 11. Read verse 11 with me. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Meaning it was not one oh, for every man threw down his rod and they became serpents. So the same thing that was done by the power of God, the devils did it. Praise the Lord. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods and Pharaoh's hand grew hard. All right? That's number one. Oh. Uh, you go to verse 19. Verse 19. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their streams, over their rivers, over their ponds, and over all their pools of water, that they may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitters of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lift up, up, lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of his servants and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Then the fish that were in the river died. The river stank. Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. There was blood throughout the land of Egypt. Look at verse 22. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. So, did they turn water into blood? Yes. So, if you are going about looking for miracles, and you think that every miracle you see is done by God, then you'll be easily deceived. Miracles is not, is not the sign. It's not the first sign of an apostle. The first sign of an apostle is character and spiritual growth. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Once somebody grows spiritually and can expound the gospel and establish you in the faith, that is the first sign. I, uh, one man of God many years ago made a profound statement that has stayed with me. He said, all he has to do to know anybody's level of spirituality is sit down with the person for about five minutes and listen to what comes out of the person's mouth. Because once you are mature spiritually, it will show in your conversation. You see, people say they're apostles and they speak like babies. They don't speak with any depth. They don't speak with any wisdom. They don't speak with any revelation. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So it is important that we understand this. So if we go back to where we are in our Bible study, we are seeing that Paul is speaking as an apostle. Go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Sorry, Peter, not Paul. Acts chapter 5. See, we are still on the issue of the apostle. They will just put print a card and say, I'm prophet. This um, the, we we don't have right now. Right now, I'm sorry to say. I don't know if we have two prophets or apostles walking this earth. I don't know if they are if they are there are very few. Because these signs that we're talking about don't consistently follow them. There are some people who teach and teach a little bit, then one or two, but in the, in the fullness of the office of the apostle, that Peter, James, and John operated on, we don't have it now. No, it's, it's coming back to the church. Praise the Lord. It's coming back. Because what God is doing is growing us in spiritual capacity to be able to do the miracles. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, let me use the natural to try to explain. The generator is on now and everything is working. If we switch off the generator and I come and pick up the remote control for the air conditions and I press, them, will it come on? If I switch on the lights, will they come on? We put on the microphone. Will it come on? No. Why not? Because the source of power is off. Is that correct? 
Praise the Lord. Now, imagine if I bring, I better pass my neighbor, that small generator that is maybe, you know, how many, how many volts is it? Maybe four, four, four volts or so. I plug it in. If I switch it on and it's on, will the lights come on? Will the lights come on? Some. Let's assume it will carry the lights. If I put on the, the AC, will it come on? What will happen to the gen? Because the load will either scatter it or switch it off. Is that, is that correct? Praise the Lord. If we take a bigger one, maybe what we have there is between 45 to 50 kVA. Let's, if we take a bigger one, maybe 10 kVA. Will it carry two or three ACs? Yes. Will it carry all the ACs? No. Why? Because the capacity is not big enough. Now watch this. It is the capacity of your spirit man that enables you to switch on the miracles when you are able to do them. Praise the Lord. So what we are after when we had fixed all these fittings in, we knew that we must get a generator that is big enough to carry it. Amen? So if you say you are an apostle and you want to be an apostolic person that does signs and wonders, the first thing you must do is grow the capacity of your spirit, which is what Jesus did from the age of 12 till he was 30. All those silent years that the Bible does not tell us what Jesus was doing. What was he doing? Growing in wisdom. Put it up, Christine. The, and, he, and he grew in wisdom and in stature and in faithful with God and with men. His capacity was increasing so that when his spirit man had increased to the full capacity, when he sees blind eyes, open because he has capacity to do it. Praise the Lord. In fact, the thing, what was, what did Jesus really focus on doing? Was it miracles? In the ministry of Jesus, what did Jesus focus on doing? Teaching. Preaching and teaching. He would gather the people and teach them. All those stories you see, the miracles did come, but they happened after the teachings. The reason Jesus gathered people was not to do miracles. It was to teach. Praise the Lord. To teach them about the kingdom. To teach them principles. It says, Jesus increased. Everybody say, increased. Say it louder, increased. Say, I must increase in wisdom, in spiritual wisdom, and stature, and in capacity, and in favor with God and with men. Notice it's God and men, not men and God. Notice, notice, the, notice the progression. The more you grow in favor with God, the more you have favor with men. Why? Because the heart of men is in God's heart. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You are looking for people to like you. Let God like you. Once God's favor is upon you, men will favor you. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 5. Did we get there? Verse 12. No, 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 no. Acts 5, 12. Yes. And through the hands of the Apostles, few signs, few signs, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And look at verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. How were they added? Through the preaching and teaching of the apostles. They were added. Peter, when, you know, we are told in Acts chapter 2, after the Holy Ghost has fallen upon them, Peter comes out and preaches. Not doing any miracle. Peter had not started doing any miracle. The first miracle that 
In fact, the first miracle Peter did was that he preached a message. 3,000 people got born again. His first message. So the apostolic grace is to establish people in the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Amen. That was the first thing before you start talking about miracles. So if someone tells you that he's an apostle, look at his works. What are the works? Is he establishing people in the kingdom through truth? Is his, the capacity of his spirit big enough to get people to stand and to grow in God? None of the rest did join them. Believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women so that they now brought the sick out into the streets, laid them on the beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by hey, might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and some were healed. They were all healed. Oh my goodness. The grace and the capacity of the apostle. And that's because they are born servants of Christ. So if we go back to Second uh, Peter chapter 1, we see that that introduction that Peter is making is loaded and he wrote it like that for a reason. What he's saying is that the person who is talking to you is me, Peter, a born servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. All right? That's his introduction. Who is he writing to? To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Many times, brethren, I used to think, I don't know if you think so, many Christians do think that the Bible is written for unbelievers. They re go and read the Bible so that you can get saved. I used to think that the Bible does keep the Bible to those people. Anybody who reads the Bible will know Jesus and get born again. Yes, I, 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 that's wrong. Wrong. The Bible is actually written to Christians to enable us to navigate the Christian life. Praise the Lord. Amen. The reason why many of us don't read the Bible as we should is because we think that we don't need it. We think the Bible is not for us. Let the unbelievers read it. You know, me, I'm already, I'm already saved. But the Bible is a manual about how to operate life. And many of us are very poor in reading manuals. You know, you buy something, you know, like your phone. Your phone has a manual. Everybody has a phone here. And your cell phone has a manual. I, I, I bet you, I can tell you with authority that your phone, not there's nobody under the sound of my voice that is using up to 50% capacity of what your phone can do. I can tell you as a fact. You can make calls. You can use the, the, the touch light. Maybe you have an FM radio. You can browse, go to Facebook, YouTube. But half of what this phone can do, you have not yet even begun to even know, not to talk of explore. Why? Because you have not read the manual of what this phone can do. There are things that this phone can do. This phone can act as a guide for you. This phone can be activated by your voice to do anything. But we don't read the manual. Even the car, you know, the car is driving. One day I noticed some strange sign on the sign on the dashboard. I said, what is this one again? I've never seen this. I've never seen this. I quickly went to the manual to go and check it. Only to find out, you know, that one button on this on the wheel is called the trip button. It, you can press it. It will now show you how many kilometers remain for your fuel to finish. To show you how many kilometers that you're going. 
it can trip and then let you know just by pressing it. It has three or four functions which it changes. And I, and I had touched it accidentally and it changed a function and was showing me another message. And I did not know because I had not read the manual. When I read the manual, I said, wow. So this one, this button does. You press it, it will show you 200 kilometers of the fuel left. Press another one, it will show you how many kilometers you drove you, you drove in the, since you started the car. You press it again, it will be changing. So many things car can do that you are not reading the manual. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There are so many things that are available to you that you do not know because you've not read your Bible. You've not read it. It's written in the Word. So he's saying, Peter, I'm writing to you those of the like faith, those who have obtained the same precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior. Now, the reason is that we must understand that faith in the sacrifice of Jesus is important. How Jesus of Nazareth came, lived, died on the cross, and then rose on the third day for our justification. When you put your faith in him, when you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth, then you now have access to the same faith that the apostles had. And you now have access to the same grace to grow and do the things that they did. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. It says, through the faith. And he calls it a precious faith because it gives us access to the life of God. Hallelujah. It is precious because as we read in verse 3, it has given us all things that pertain to life and to godliness. Once you get born again, you, are, you now have access to something called Zoe, life, the life of God. The substance inside God that makes God God. You now have access into it. That substance contains his wisdom and his power. Without you being born again, you don't have access to it. Praise the Lord. You, you walk around, but you, you have natural, you know, is that, let me look for a natural example. Um, <laughs> the, the, I'll use America. America is probably the greatest nation on the earth. Everybody wants, everybody I know, we are proud Nigerians, but everybody I know would like to own an American passport. Why? Why? Because the American passport gives you access to all the privileges of the American cities. Praise the Lord. Amen? You could be in America, you know, maybe, all right, I'll give you an example. One good example is coming to me. I had a Nigerian passport. I traveled to the UK. And I was there for about two months. I had a long vacation and it took time to be there. When I was there, I was saying, ah, my money was, 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 the money I took was reduced. I said, ah, it would be nice to do a job oh, because they do jobs weekly. Can't I do a job? So, you know, my cousin took me somewhere. And the person asked me, he said, do you have, are you, are you a citizen? And I said, no, I'm not. I'm a Nigerian. I said, okay, uh, do you have a work permit? You, you, your passport, does it permit you to work? And I said, no, it's a visiting uh, visa. He said, ah, no, I can't employ you. And if I employ you, I'll have a problem with the authorities. That you're allowed to visit, we are not allowed to work. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, and it was interesting. I was going, I said, that's interesting. So the, the type of visa that I had did not allow me to earn an income in the UK. I didn't have access to certain things. When you are not a Christian, when you are not born again, you don't have access to the life of God, the Zoe. When we say, put up that verse, put up verse 3. Yes, put up verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life. When you see life there, most people think of money, cars, houses, all that. That is correct. But that's not what that verse means. 
It means that the thing that will give you access to the money, to the health, to the cars, is so we. The life of God, which is converted into dunamis, which can now produce cars and houses for you. Praise the Lord. I'm going to say it again. Follow me. There's something inside God. If you could cut, if you, if you could use a knife, and, or you use a razor blade and cut yourself, what will flow out? What will flow out? Blood. It is blood that keeps us alive. Inside of God, God does not have blood. God has something called Zoe, living water, eternal life, any of those names. If you could cut God, what will flow out of him is Zoe. Praise the Lord. When we get born again, your spirit now has access to that Zoe. Because you get reconnected back to God. And Zoe now flows in your spirit. That life of God. All right. A little, a little biology lesson. If you cut yourself and your blood flows out, how many, how much blood do we have in the body? How much blood flows through your body? How much? About four liters. About four liters of blood flowing around your body. Okay? As your body. Uh, Sister Christian, am I correct? I'm not. How many liters? Are you are the biology expert now. I think it's about four liters. Thereabouts. Please check. Just confirm for me. It's about four liters. Thereabouts. I think I'm correct. Now, it flows through your body. If you cut yourself and the blood begins to flow out, when it gets to a point where three liters or two liters have flown out, what will happen to you? You will faint. If all your blood pours out, what will happen to you? You die. Why? Because the life is in the blood. The blood carries everything that keeps you alive and circulates it around your body. Oxygen, food, all the things that your body needs. It flows around and the blood is the carrier taking from your head. The heart pumps it and it goes into all types of the body. Now, if blood does not flow, say, to your right leg, blood stops flowing to that right leg, what will happen to that leg? What will happen? Paralyzed. Become numb. Because the thing giving it life has been cut off. Praise the Lord. God has flowing through him Zoe. That Zoe has all the things that make him God. His omniscience, his omnipotence, his power, his wisdom is inside of that Zoe. When we get born again, we get connected to Zoe. That's why Paul calls it precious faith. It's precious. Because once you have that life of God, then you can begin the process of conversion into dunamis. Dunamis is called power. Dunamis is the thing that makes the, 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 the when he says, let there be light, light comes out. Let's use the natural. I need you to get this. Go to the generator. Let's go back to the generator. What is the generator running on? Diesel. Is it the diesel that is switching on the light? Is it the diesel that is powering the house? No, it's not. The generator has components and electrical system and all that mechanical system inside. But to power it, you need to put in diesel. Praise the Lord. Diesel could be the sewing, the life. Then the generator now begins to work. It turns the turbines and does all the things and then sends out electrical power called dunamis, which is what powers the house. Praise the Lord. In God, when we get born again, the diesel or the petrol that you put in your engine is the life of God. So when we say in Jesus' name, we have life. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, I came that you may have life, Zoe, and life abundantly. Now, when we take in the Zoe, 
we now have the material which can be converted into dunamis, which can now give us power to heal. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So when you come to church, I will say, in Jesus' name, we have life. Father, give life to my spirit. Zoe is entry. Give life to my spirit. Zoe is entry. Give life to my spirit. Zoe. So you now have your heart full of Zoe. But that Zoe inside there now needs to be converted into power through prayer and through your speaking of the word. Praise the Lord. The woman, the issue of blood. Now, in the case of the Lord Jesus, and Peter, James, and John, and Paul, they have now grown over the years that the Zoe has moved from spirit into soul, into body. So that so much so that when the woman with the issue of blood, what did she say? If I can only touch what? The hem of his garment, I will be healed. What she's saying, she realized that the power of God that Jesus is carrying in his spirit is so much that it has transferred from his spirit through into his physical body and is now also residing in his garment. So I don't need him to pray. All I need is to touch his garment and that power will be converted into dunamis to heal. Praise the Lord. Amen. And that's what she did. We know the story. But what did Jesus say? Who touched me? And he looked around. And Peter said, ah, this whole crowd. And you are saying, who touched me? Jesus said, no. Somebody touched me. Why? How did he know? Because he felt power has left him. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Power had left him. So he turned and saw the woman. The woman now confessed, said, ah, your faith has saved you. So when we say that he has given us, that's why in verse 2, we are still in verse we'll come. I will explain this point when we get to verse 3. But I wanted us to just drop, you see, when Paul says, we have obtained like precious faith. Paul said that this faith is precious. What you have is precious. What you're carrying, if you believe in Jesus, is precious. But most people don't know and most people don't use it, and most people don't exercise it, and most people don't convert it. So you're just walking around with either little life or life that is not converted into Zoe. Praise the Lord. Into dynamics. You need to convert it. How do we do that? Through prayer. Through prayer. Through confession of the word. Through all the spiritual exercises that we're doing. We convert ourselves in, into, into, into Zoe. It contains God's power and his wisdom. When you get born again, we need to begin to close now. First Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 23. First Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block to the Greeks, even foolishness, but to those who are called, those of us, both Jews and Greeks, what is Christ? The power of God and the wisdom of God. The two things that we have access to now as Christians, power of God and the wisdom of God. Power to heal, power to deliver, Power to break yokes, which is what we pray when we're about to start any message. Power to free men. Power to bless. Power to prosper. Power to create wealth. That power, we now have access to it as well as the wisdom of God. You now have the mind of God. What to do at every time. You have wisdom. You know, I, recently I ran into a quote which has stayed with me and which I'm going to be saying a lot. It's Joyce Meyer who said it. Wisdom is doing today something that will profit you or benefit you tomorrow. Foolishness is doing today something that will be detrimental to you tomorrow. Those two states, it's not an abuse. When somebody says you are wise, it's not a praise. It's just an act. You have done something. When somebody says you are foolish, it means that it's not an abuse. It means that what you have done is something that will harm you in front. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So wisdom 
is doing something today that will benefit you tomorrow. So we now have access to God's wisdom, knowing what to do today that will give us profit tomorrow. Hallelujah. The wisdom and the power of God. So access to that divine nature to be like God in every way is why Paul or Peter says, sorry, Peter says that it is precious faith to those who have access like precious faith to us. It is to us that he is writing. So I believe with this, let's leave it here. We'll now talk we'll go in next week. We'll talk about grace and peace being multiplied. You know, two things. Grace, that's why I said each verse is loaded. Grace is one level. Peace is another level. Multiplication is another level. When God is doing something for you, he doesn't add, he multiplies. Praise the Lord. So next week we'll see what 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 does he mean by grace? What does he mean by, by peace? Why is Peter praying that they should be multiplied? Very important. But for today, what we have understood is that the born servant of Christ, the slave, if you want to be great, you must be a servant. He has gone up and he's saying that he's writing to those of us who have obtained, ah, one more thing before we close, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Watch this. Please. Turn to NLT. Take this to NLT version. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We've dealt with that. I'm writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. I'll explain that. It's a precious faith. It's, not, it's precious not because it can give us visa or cars or houses but because he gives us legal access to the life of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I hope you understand that. Say, I now have legal access. Say it again. I have legal access to the life of God, to Zoe. The thing that makes God God is available to me. I now have to go through the process of converting it into power or dunamis, which will enable me now have access to cars, to houses, to healing, to blessings. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. All right. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ. Our what? Our what? Our what? Our God and Savior. How many of you know that Jesus is God? Oh, yeah. The people have asked one Muslim, I heard one Muslim cleric that there's no way that Jesus said he's God. You don't see that. Our God and Savior. This is an affirmation, a confirmation that Jesus is both God and Savior. Praise the Lord. Also in John 20 28, if they ask you, is Jesus God? The answer is a definite yes. Quote this verse. It's easy. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Our God and Savior. Another verse that I will give you to quote in John chapter 20 verse 28. Eh? Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. When, when Jesus showed him his hands, Thomas bowed. He said, my Lord spoke by revelation. My Lord and my God. That no other person could have risen from the dead except he was God. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Jesus is God. Second person of the Godhead. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three distinct, maybe this is where we start from next week so I don't just take too much time on it. But leave it, we'll expand it next week before we move on to verse, verse 2. He is God and Savior. Everything about God is in him. Colossians chapter 2 tells us in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead body. Put inside the human body everything about God. He says, I and my Father are one. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
And let me give you good news as we close. You are also God's. You are not, we are not God. We are God's. We are not capital God. We are not God the Father. But the Bible says, know ye not that ye are God's. Why? Because we also have access to the life of God. Bow your head, let's pray. Christianity is a just faith. Don't joke with what you have. It's a precious faith. You have legal rights. When we say in Jesus' name, we have life. Legally, we have access to Zoe. You have it in your spirit. The minute you say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I confess you as my Lord and my Savior. I receive you as God into my heart. I believe you died for my sin by your righteousness. And on the third day, you rose again for my justification. Legally, power has been released into your spirit so that you receive so we, the life of God. Precious faith. Also, make yourself a born servant. Submit completely. Those who will be great must serve. Father, we thank you for your word that has come this morning to us. And we ask in the name of Jesus that these words will cause us to stand in the grace that you have given unto us. Open our eyes that we may know what we carry. Open our eyes that we may understand the precious faith that you have released to us. Give unto us understanding that Lord, even at this time, we will continue to do your will, as we submit completely to you as born servants, as slaves, so that we enter into the fullness of that which you have called us to be. We honor you, Father. Lord Jesus, precious Holy Spirit, we pray that the conversion process of Zoe to dunamis in our lives will not be aborted, but that we will continue to grow in capacity, in spirit, and in power. Thank you, Father. As we pray now in the Spirit, establish us in the truth of these things. In Jesus' name. Let's pray for ourselves in the Spirit. La pranda capra casuta le masu, zende de, rimus seke de bikende de mende, roko to koto do bodo kopakazo, salabana kapakata, palimus sin de mende de bodo kopakazo, suta capra kaza, shandalamana kapakazi de mende. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit. We give you all glory and praise. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Let's go, Lord, clap off for you.